Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Music Production Podcast, the show where we talk about all things related to making music. And I'm your host, Brian Funk. And today on the show, I have Stephanie Merchet. And I know I'm stretching myself on your pronunciation, Stephanie. Uh, we went over that, but uh, you might want to correct me on that in a second. But um, Stephanie does some really awesome music, uh, especially in like, uh, I think in a sound design sense and ambient stuff and creating moods and using sounds and textures that might not really be like musical instruments necessarily, but it turns into these really nice soundscapes and it's, it's a wide variety of music too. And um, I'm very excited to talk to you, Stephanie, just to like learn a bit about how you're making all of this beautiful sound. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure to have you. Um, we were just kind of going over it, but maybe um, if you can tell us a little bit about like your background and where your kind of musical sensibilities come from. Okay, so uh, I have a classical music background, conservatory, uh, piano, but I haven't played in over 15 years. I also have um, a music education degree from university. Um, I've always loved composition and uh, I love experimenting with sound and trying new stuff. Um, so I always uh, try to find interesting new ways uh, and uh, really use whatever sound might uh, inspire me. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, sounds from day-to-day uh, -day life. Something that um, kind of like interests me a little bit is you haven't been playing the piano at all in 15 years yeah something like that uh, really? i mean i i did um, i i used to work for studios in beirut and uh part of my job was composing music for uh movies and tv ads and uh, radio jingles mm. and uh, we did have a uh, <laughs> A MIDI keyboard controller that I did use at the time, but here uh, when I compose my own stuff, I don't use the keyboard at all. I just, um, you know, work with audio or uh, external gear sometimes. I have uh, a few synthesizers, uh, but synthesizers that do not have a keyboard, mm -hmm. like the <laughs> Moog Mother 32, for example, oh, or fun. just uh, really tiny keyboards like the Volca keys. Yeah. And uh, but usually when I work with MIDI, it's just with the mouse. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. It, is that almost like a form of rebellion in a way? Uh, well, I never really uh, felt like connected to the piano. Mm -hmm. It was uh, more. Uh, of my way into music and not really, I, I never felt I was going to be uh, like a, a, a doing concerts or anything. Yeah. It was just more uh, as a tool for other stuff like composition and uh, trying harmonies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, that's cool that you've gone like kind of like, spun around 180 degrees and have uh, sort of rejected the piano to, for other methods. Yeah, but I still love listening to piano and I have yeah. no problem with the instrument itself. <laughs> it's just that I don't, I don't feel like I really want to play it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess there are so many worlds to unlock in audio, right? Um, yeah, it's uh, like an infinite uh, source of inspiration, and uh, yeah, yeah. And um, you mentioned the the Mother Thirty Two by Moog, and uh, I just read a post somebody put up, and they wrote. I think they were talking about um, the drummer from Another Mother, the other. It's very similar yeah. type of thing. Um, yeah. and it was like rule number one, always record whatever you're doing because it's such like a living instrument that puts out so many interesting sounds and it's very tweakable and hands-on. 
Yeah, it's true. Actually, uh, whenever I'm working with external gear, it's just hit record and play. Mm. So, yeah, uh, I I rarely ever delete anything that I record with my external gear. And uh, it usually turns into uh, tracks. I mean, I don't, I don't throw away, away anything I uh, record with my uh, synthesizers. Now, does this mean you have like a process of like going back and sifting through your recordings to find interesting parts? Uh, depends on what I'm working on. I do that sometimes, but not always. Uh, um, with the synthesizers, it's a bit of a different uh, process. Mm. Uh, I record, I keep the takes. On the same day, I go through them. Okay. And... Uh, mix or edit a bit uh, and uh, usually it turns into EPs or albums that I do release right. uh, now with other stuff like projects I work on as MIDI or uh, or uh, sampling and stuff like that uh, there are a lot of projects that I started and just abandoned. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some times where I just start something, don't like it. Then a couple of weeks later, I, I'm like, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> Maybe I should do something with, that, uh, with it. Uh, so I go back and try to uh, turn it uh, usually into something totally different well you can still feel the original uh, mood or original uh, uh, nature of the sound but uh, it usually turns into something pretty different from what uh, what it was mm. uh, for example I did uh, I did that not long ago with a uh, a track that I wanted to submit uh, to the Music Weekly Challenge, and uh, I didn't like it, so I didn't submit it. But then later on, I took the material and uh, made two new tracks out of it. That's really cool. It's um, something I've been really interested in lately, because I too have a hard drive full of um, songs I've started and never finished. I think a lot of people have that. So I've been trying to go back and figure out what are the like interesting things I can take from it and pull out for maybe reuse later. And then it, it kind of alleviates a little bit of guilt I have about all of those unfinished ideas. <laughs> Makes me feel a little better about it. I was curious, um, what, what kind of techniques do you like to do to um, play with your sounds when you're revisiting them like that? I do a lot of uh, stretching of audio and pitch shifting and reversing. And uh, I actually use uh, Ableton Live as my uh, main DAW. Mm -hmm. And I really like um, uh, changing the stretching algorithms. You know, there is the... Um, uh, beats algorithm and tones and texture and repitch and complex and complex pro and those uh, can yield really interesting uh, results when you uh, uh, tweak the different uh, parameters you get all those uh, clicky sounds uh, sometimes mm -hmm. and um, I mainly use all native uh, instruments so all Ableton's and um, um, sorry, okay. uh, plugins, um, yeah, effects, and um, I really like the resonators one and uh, the corpus because they add uh, a lot of harmonics to the sound, so you can uh, change a sound that uh, sounds really monotonous and. Uh, 
kind of uninteresting into something that has a you can you can feel different notes in it mm. after uh, you process it and uh, depending on the kind of music I'm, that I'm doing definitely it's I, I don't use the same effects for everything uh, but um, for ambient stuff I really like uh, using the a ping pong delay and I like to use it as repitch and yeah. then changing the time <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, reverb with uh, really long decays sometimes uh, on 100 percent wet mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of layering too so I for example take uh, uh, one sample that I have stretched uh, pitched 12 uh, semitones up, another layer pitched 12 semitones down. Uh, sometimes just the same sample that has been um, uh, a stretch with different algorithm, algorithms of uh, Ableton, like one would be uh, with the beats algorithm, another one would be with the repitch or uh, with the textures and then playing with the size of the grain, for example. <coughs> um, yeah, basically that's it. Uh, when I'm using when I'm using audio as uh, the source material uh, for more beat oriented stuff, I I really love Operator. <laughs> mm. Uh, it's uh, it's really uh, amazing what you can do with FM synthesis. Um, I've done full tracks just using Operator, oh, uh, from cool. the from the drums to the bass to the leads to the SFX <laughs> everything. Yeah, and uh, that's that goes back to the fact that I really like to challenge myself, uh, and. Uh, when I use it, I when I use uh, operator, I usually do it from scratch, do everything from scratch. I mean, I create my own sounds from scratch. Oh, that's that's cool. That's fun. You, um, your idea of the way you use the warping algorithms is probably my favorite way to do it too. They're kind of intended for correcting timing and making your tracks align, but it's so fun to misuse those and. Yeah, overstretch yeah, things yeah. And, and like you said to start trying the different algorithms and turning the controls they're, they're actually the, some of the parameters like uh, you can't map to um, a knob unfortunately yeah so, yeah the grain size yeah. and the flux and all that yeah right so I find myself like setting up another track to record myself just pushing things around and moving things around and seeing if I can get interesting stuff. So it's like a process that leads to another process to another process. So I could see yeah. how you get so much out of just one sample and so many different algorithms and time stretching and things like that. Um, FM synthesis is, is very complicated and interesting too. Um, ha have you, um, how, how well do you feel you have a handle on that? Like, um, I I like when I when I use operator for instance um I, there's always like a a bit of mystery to it there's surprise around every corner Yeah it's true I mean I I go by ear and mm. experimentation Yeah really but uh you know when you're when you're used to use a certain tool uh after I don't know, a few years, you just know that doing this will get you to that result. Yeah. <laughs> so it's become like a bit like a second nature, <laughs> but I'm not sure I could uh, really explain to someone how to do it, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> you could show, but you, you yeah, to put it in yeah, the words. I can, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I could show that this does that, but why it does that? I mean, I haven't... Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't really uh, study synthesis uh, mathematically or anything, you know. Yeah, yeah it can get pretty it's more, mathematic. 
with yeah, FM. it's more it's more uh, by practice and mm-hmm. trial and error, and uh, yeah. And as I said, the main thing is experimentation. Yeah. Uh, I think that with art, uh, people shouldn't be afraid to try stuff and try new stuff, whatever the results are. I mean, there is there isn't really anything wrong or right. I mean, yeah, there are stuff that <laughs> obviously <laughs> if you're uh, EQing or uh, panning mm-hmm. or compressing for a mix, for example, yeah, there can be some stuff that are wrong <laughs> or that will sound bad, but the actual uh, creative process, there is no wrong or right. That's my opinion anyway. <laughs> I, I agree with you totally. I think it's one of the beautiful things about music is it is so open and without any kind of like right or wrong, as you said. But there's also a technical aspect, like especially when you start talking about mixing and things like that. But um, it's, it's just a great balance of this like creative free exploration and then also a little bit of technique. You know, you have like keys, you have certain musical rules. And then and when you start mixing, there's certain things you can and can't really do. But I, I almost hesitate to even say that because there's always an exception where you can break those rules too. So it's just a really fun kind of seesaw battle between pushing the boundaries, but also going with certain conventions at certain times. Yeah, true. I agree with that too. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, challenging yourself, and I noticed that through your work, there's often like um, maybe some sort of like challenge or experiment or question at the center of it. I know, like for myself, and I, I say this a lot on the show, but I love coming down to the studio and seeing where the wind takes me and wondering what's next and just letting it all happen. But once I actually come up with some sort of idea, some sort of maybe, like you say, challenge or limitation, that's when things actually start to happen and get done. Um, I was, I guess I was kind of curious if you could talk about some of the ways like you like to challenge yourself. Like, I guess one of them would be trying to make a whole track using just the operator FM synth and Ableton. Yeah, I actually do that a lot, uh, just um, starting from really simple or minimal material. Mm. Uh, For example, making a whole album with just uh, uh, a small melody played on a glockenspiel, for example. I have, uh, yeah, I have one that was made that way. Uh, Or... uh, making a track uh, out of a recording from a washing machine, for example. Oh, cool. (laughs) Or another one uh, that I made, uh, (laughs) I recorded myself eating a cereal bar, for example. (laughs) It was just, uh, I don't know, like 10 seconds of of sound. And I, again, using stretching and layering and, it's shifting and all that, uh, I turned that into uh, some sort of dark ambient track. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, Is that on uh, your yeah. band camp that we can hear that? Uh, the, or, or, the washing machine, yes, it is there. The washing machine. Uh, yeah, the other one, I don't think it is anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the, the one uh, using the small melody yeah it's called uh, collapsing stretch structures and is it is on Bandcamp. okay nice and, i'll put the uh, link to that i'd like to i'm gonna enjoy listening to that knowing that it's just the one instrument yeah Th- those are great challenges there's um oh man i'm gonna draw a blank on the name uh who did it but um Somebody created this album not a couple of years back where every sound was made with uh, an alarm clock uh, by, I want to say Brahm was the name of the company. 
Uh, I, sh- I, I don't know if I should bring things up when I can barely remember what I'm talking about, but every single sound on the album was made with just an alarm clock. And that was, when I heard that, I, it really like kind of just opened up a world of possibilities for me because I think at that point I was really concerned with like, I was just getting into like um, certain computer programs and plugins. And I was trying to download everything I could find off the internet. I thought if I had more stuff, I could make better music. But then this came out and just changed my whole philosophy in a lot of ways. And um, I, I made a similar decision to you where um, I got rid of all the stuff I had kind of like illegally downloaded in the dark alleys of the internet. And I just focused on what was inside Ableton Live and learning all of that stuff. And it, it really changed um, my my output and my productivity and my learning because instead of trying to acquire things I was trying to learn the things I already had and um, it's such a great challenge to give yourself almost nothing to work with and see what you can do with it yeah true and uh, something I find also is that uh, the projects are way more stable when you just use the yeah, stuff that come with your doll. <laughs> it's true. That was another factor because I was trying to do live performance and I was like, I can't take any chances if I'm going to do this in front of people. <laughs> true, true, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the live thing, uh, that's actually what pushed me to, <laughs> to use hardware and not go with a laptop because I've had a few times where I was there with my laptop and then I discovered later why this was happening but I just had sound dropout and Uh uh, it turns out that uh, the connection between the sound card and the laptop was uh, just dropping because of the subwoofer frequencies Oh, kind of shaking and everything loose. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, <no>. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I fixed that later by uh, putting foam under the <laughs> the sound card. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I um, that was one of the reasons that uh, pushed me to uh, acquire a few external gear. Mm-hmm. That plus the fact that uh, I really like the. Um, the hands-on pro- approach of uh, hardware synthesizers and sample samplers. Right. What do you like to use for your live performance? What kind of gear? Well, it depends on, again, what mm. kind of uh, show I'm playing. If I'm doing more uh, ambient and dark ambient stuff, I would usually take my uh, Mother 32, my Volca, a couple of pedals. And uh, yeah, that's it usually. Um, with more glitchy stuff, uh, I would add the electron digitact. Mm. And uh, if I'm doing like uh, club stuff, it will it will be either the electron digitact doing all the percussion stuff plus a synthesizer. Uh, or the electron and uh, the novation circuit. Mm-hmm. It, uh, again, it all depends on the on the context and where I'm playing and what I'm playing. Right. Is um is are you doing most of that from scratch? Is it like um, or is it kind of like a prepared performance of like songs that you have? Uh, the ambient stuff is usually 100% improvised. Nice. Uh, the techno stuff, no, definitely not. I mean, I do prepare ahead uh, just patterns and then I, you know, mangle them live, <laughs> adding effects and uh, muting stuff and uh, playing with the tempo and uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, you have to be a little more ready for that, I guess. But um, there must be fun to have the thrill of the unknown with the ambient stuff. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's a totally different uh, uh, mood and experience uh, from, let's say, a 
techno set. Yeah. It's uh, it's a lot more. Uh, it has a lot more to do with uh, listening and uh, reacting to what you're hearing because also it depends on the acoustics of the space and uh, all that. And so yeah, the, the 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 ambient stuff that are improvised. It's just kind of a conversation with your instruments. Mm-hmm. Literally, yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's that's um something I would love to experiment with at some time. That that just kind of uh free nature of like, you know, I don't really know what what I'm doing yet and what it's gonna be, but we'll kinda like we'll work together with the machine and figure it out as we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. You mentioned the uh music weekly challenges. Um, and that's something I've been following on, on Twitter. I haven't really done any of them myself, but, uh, can you tell everyone about that a little bit just so they know? Yeah, sure. It's a community of composers from all over the world and from, um, actually very different levels. Some people are professional. Some people are just doing that for fun. Some people are just starting out. Mm. And uh, every week there's a new theme that's uh, posted on Twitter, uh, uh, on the Twitter account of Music Weeklies. And uh, whoever wants to take part has a week to uh, come up with something inspired by the theme. Mm. And uh, usually people... uh, listen to uh, the submissions and uh, comment on the submissions and uh, yeah and retweet and we're all uh, like a like a big family actually there's a lot of support in there yeah and uh, people are really nice to each other and uh, supportive and uh, yeah yeah, I guess when you're going through that together, like you know what it's like to try to create a track with one particular theme or challenge. And then when you hear other people's music, it's there's that kind of like camaraderie that happens. Like, oh, this is what you did with that? Listen to this. This It's totally different than what I thought I would do. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing the uh, how many different uh, approaches to uh, the themes. Mm. you will f- you will hear in uh, in the submissions yeah uh, it seems like the perfect thing for the way you like to work too with challenging yourself and <laughs> yeah yeah sometimes i don't uh, i don't uh, submit anything because uh, you know uh, we have a <laughs> life and uh, <laughs> and sometimes you just don't don't find either the inspiration or the time or yeah. or maybe you just don't like what you do you know mm-hmm. like like it happened to me I mean yeah sometimes I try something and then I'm like oh no I don't I I really don't like that and uh, I I, actually I never release anything to the public (laughs) let's say if I'm not personally 100% 100 satisfied with it Mm -hmm. but you seem like you're also not afraid to um to fail with your music, so to speak, like um, you 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 seem like kind of fearless in your um, explorations, where you're willing to just have something that maybe you, you don't like enough to share, but like just to give yourself the freedom to go there if, if it happens to be that way. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, uh, what what will I lose if I try <laughs> something new? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's a good attitude and, to have because sometimes we get so caught up in the output and the finished product and it can really make music making or an art in general, it can kind of kill the fun of it if you get too focused on that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely it's great when people like what you do, but I don't think this is the the, the goal. Mm. I mean, art is more of a 
a way of expressing yourself, expressing a mood, expressing an idea. And uh, when people like it, it's even better, mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure. But this shouldn't be the, the, the purpose of making art. Yeah. Hmm. That's how I see it anyway. Well, I, I think it's a good way because if you have that approach of like, like you said, what do I have to lose? I think the real truth is you have everything to gain because you're going to be doing things that you wouldn't normally do instead of relying on the safe things that work and kind of wind up producing the same thing over and over again. You're expanding your, your abilities and your techniques that way. Um, you, you, um, also into photography as well, correct? And use that as a lot of inspiration for your work. Yes. True. 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 I actually, uh, try to make all my covers. I mean, all the covers for my albums and EPs, mm -hmm. uh, unless a label wants to do it, but I usually do it myself. And, um, yeah, I for the, the the releases covers. I I like to actually uh, take photos of maybe daily stuff that would look uh, really uninteresting, and then mm. process them into some sort of abstract art. That's very and similar um, how you do music then. Yeah, yeah, true, <laughs> true. Uh, on the other on the other side, I I love nature, so I do take a lot of uh, uh, nature photos, but they they don't uh, <laughs> end up as covers. <laughs> Those mm -hmm. are like a different uh, side of me. Mm. It's more of a um, uh, of a wow <laughs> factor, you know, like. A, you see a, a beautiful plant and you're, oh, wow, that's amazing. I should, <laughs> I should uh, look at it uh, from different angles and, <laughs> yeah. and try to capture its beauty or, yeah. Hmm. Hey, that's cool too, you know. Um, I think a lot of inspiration can be drawn from nature and, and there's a lot of music in nature if you listen to. Yes, absolutely true. Uh, Unfortunately, yeah. we're we're really uh, losing that. I mean, uh, noise pollution and all that. Yeah. And this is also uh, uh, something that uh, inspires me. I I made uh, an album uh, using. Uh, recordings from construction sites and uh, yeah because uh, the construction industry is one of the most polluting uh, industries actually mm. so yeah that was also an inspiration for one of my works you know um in the uh, last month or so since um, we've been told to stay at home and we don't go anywhere really and uh, everything is shut down more or less um, at night I, I often take my dogs for a walk at night and the quiet is incredible it's um, and it's also like right now in, in New York it's um, early spring so we don't have like all of the insects yet that make all the noise in the summertime at night. And mm -hmm. it's yeah. just this like spectacular quiet that we get now. If I go yeah, out with true. my dogs like around midnight and I, I just, it's, it's striking, you know, and it really makes you understand like w there's just always like the hum of a machine or a highway or something in the background. And now that's taken away and it's, it's pretty powerful. Yeah, true. I mean, it's. Uh, I think it's all over the world. I I did notice that uh, a few days ago. I was like, oh wow, that's so quiet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You had mentioned um, 
something called citizen memory. I think we were talking about this bef- before we city cities and memory. Yeah. Oh, cities and memories. Yeah, cities and memories. Okay, and that sounded like a pretty cool project. I, I wanted to ask you to talk about that a little bit because um, it seems like a great resource too for musicians. Yes, yes, it's a it's a growing database of field recordings and uh, reimagined field recordings. Uh, Anyone can actually take part, uh, even if you just have a, f- a phone to record. You don't have necessarily have to own, uh, uh, you know, expensive recording yeah. equipment. And um, uh, those field recordings and their reimagined uh, versions uh, get uh, uh, posted on a. Um, map of the world so basically you know you know each field recording uh, where where each field recording uh, was taken and uh, from time to time there are open calls for specific projects um, uh, for example now there's a pr- an, on- an ongoing project uh, with a collection from the smithsonian museum uh, so basically we uh, each artist uh, chose a, a photo as inspiration for a music uh, piece. Mm. And uh, there has been a project about uh, sacred places. It was all field recordings uh, from um, churches, uh, Buddhist temples, uh, and... Uh, Another project was uh, about uh, um, what's it called? <laughs> uh, protests, yeah. Okay. Uh, so there were um, recordings from the when the banking collapsed and all that, and uh, so yeah. Okay, so that would be that would be a lot of interesting sounds. <laughs> I love that that it's put on a map so you can get this kind of like cultural and historical angle from it too. Yeah, yeah. It's a really interesting uh, project. Mm. I've been um, taking part for a while actually. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to have to check that out. I, I like that idea a lot. I've done little um, experiments. I think I did it like twice where, um, cause I, I like to make, um, Ableton live packs and with a lot of sampling really, but, um, you know, make my own instruments and sounds and release them to, for people to download. And I did one where I asked people, I did it on like Facebook or Twitter or something. I said, Hey, wherever you are right now, just make a recording, even if it's on your phone and then send it to me and, and I'll collect them all and we'll release that as a sound pack and it was pretty cool to just get you know people from all over just oh this is where i am i'm at a birthday party and this is the sound i got for you <laughs> yeah cool yeah i i love that there's no requirement on the gear too because um the phone i mean i, I almost can't even say this for much longer because the quality keeps getting better and better but um the microphones on the phone are you know they're not like your professional field recording mics. Yeah, anyway. no, sure, definitely not. <laughs> but I do find that a lot of times that works to my advantage when I start messing with the sounds and stretching them and pulling them apart. They tend to have like some kind of weird artifacts that better recordings don't have. It's true. I mean, um, I don't own any uh, professional recorder. Mm-hmm. So basically everything I record, all the field recordings or, or the samples that I use in my music are recorded on the phone. Oh, cool. I, I don't even have like an ex- extension microphone or anything. Yeah. It's just the, the regular phone. <laughs> right. <laughs> my, my microphone, yeah. Uh, but yeah as, you, yeah, as you said, the, the actual look, quality kind of low quality uh gives that this kind of organic feel or yeah and uh, especially if you're not gonna use it as is and you're gonna 
process it. Yeah. So basically, it doesn't really matter if it's not top quality. Right. Yeah, I, I always encourage people. I teach a sampling class online, and um, I I always encourage people like don't be discouraged if you don't have your fancy recorder with you you know you probably already have your phone wherever you go <laughs> anyway and there's something kind of magical about it it's just nice it's so convenient and it's so much better to get the recording even if you're not thrilled with the quality than to not get it at all sure i agree 100 <laughs> percent. i took that kind of thinking about as far as i could um by getting, um, I used to have these all the time. I used to use them all the time. The, uh, the uh, micro cassette recorders. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, like yeah. people used to record their ideas and yeah, <laughs> yeah. on the little tapes. And um, I've been recording uh, like anything, any instrument, you know, with that mic. And then even I've mic'd the speaker on it <laughs> with another oh, microphone. Wow, yeah. And it just, it's like a, it sounds terrible. You can hear like the humming of the motor and everything. But when you put it in a sampler and you start stretching it across the keyboard or or just manipulating it, reversing it, pitching it, I, it's like there's like a whole world in there that you just sort of like True. find and unlock. And I love it. It's um, just so cool that so it's like things that might technically be undesirable suddenly become magic. Yeah, yeah. And nowadays, actually, the the cassettes are coming back to yeah to uh, yeah. And uh, even uh, I I saw someone who actually released an EP or an album on a micro cassette. Oh really? Whoa! <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's a tough medium. But then I don't know who who still. Yeah, I I don't know who still has the the actual recorder player yeah. to <laughs> to play it. Yeah, I have. I, I'm when I was a teenager till about like my early twenties. Like that was what I used to record all my ideas. I have like a whole box of those little tapes, and they're just filled with who knows what. Um, but. I had two or three of those recorders and none of them worked. I had to order one on eBay and they were surprisingly expensive. It was like, yeah, it was like uh, 60 or $70, I think. And I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're coming back to yeah. being something fashionable. <laughs> right. Like there must've been like a dip where you could get them for just a couple pennies. <laughs> and then uh, they've like kind of gone back up. It's funny how that works, but they are great. I'm. It's a great way to to uh, manipulate sound, even if you. I've even put them up to my monitors and just sampled whatever was coming out of my speakers. It might be like a soft synth, and then put that back in, and then all of a sudden you got like this crazy weird off recording with a lot of character. Yeah. And a lot of hiss and uh, yeah, a lot of noise and, uh, and warping and all that. Yeah, yeah the pitch is always uh, <laughs> <laughs> wobbling. And yeah, but it's it's cool because um, you know, like we're in a day and age where you can make things just so perfect and so clean and uh, sterile. Really, is the word yeah, I, I yeah. think where true. You, like it, it doesn't sound like it even happened anywhere, where there's it's not even in a room, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And things can sound so separate and cold, but a little bit of that stuff can really bring things back to life. True. Yeah, I think your your recordings are a great example of that, like where things sound really, really like lifelike in a weird I mean it doesn't sound like any place I've ever been but <laughs> it sounds <laughs> like alive and living and you know it's a lot of interesting things to pay attention to yeah, actually I try to not get bored myself when listening back to my music <laughs> that's okay, basically that's <laughs> <laughs> so if I if I'm bored with what I'm hearing it means that it still needs work 
Okay. <laughs> and uh, I I do use a lot of automations and uh, yeah. Yeah. Does that happen if you work too long? Do you find that too? That, that I mean, you know, sometimes you're producing a track and you listen to it a thousand times before it's done. <laughs> yeah, no, not really. I mean, it's uh, no, I don't. If I don't get bored of the track after two weeks of working on it, then it's fine, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> And when when I say two weeks, I mean two weeks and like every day two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, would you say you are spending that time generally on a song? Uh it depends. Yeah. It depends. Really, the, the some tracks are just done in, in yeah. an hour. <laughs> Literally. Right. I love when that happens. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Other other tracks, uh, or actually more albums, usually yeah. take a lot more time. Right. But then it really all depends on maybe the mood I'm in or how tired I am I am or <laughs> yeah, a lot of different factors mm. come into play. So uh I mean I I did an EP in two weeks not long ago. Oh nice. Yeah, that's pretty cool. The thing is I had started it way before that and i didn't like the first version so i just started from scratch two more times so basically i did that thing three times <laughs> uh -huh. but the the final version was done in, t in two weeks yeah yeah so i guess you found something that got you interested and excited to follow through yeah on yeah, yeah. What was that? Was it is it anything you can point to? Any was it like uh, that? Yeah, actually it's a, it's an EP that's on my Bandcamp uh, page. Uh, imagine a story and fill in the blanks. That's the name. Okay. It's um a bit of industrial techno, a bit of experimental stuff, uh, more ambient stuff. It's just five tracks if I mm. remember correctly I don't always remember how many tracks I have on an yeah. album because I, I just make a lot of music and uh, yeah it's five tracks mm. I think that's a good approach um, the, the kind of like quantity approach of just pump things out and uh, you know choose from yeah, it yeah I mean the more you practice your yeah. uh, your art or your craft uh, the better you you will get yeah I'm sure yeah going through the process all of the steps over and over again I think yeah and, and like you were saying earlier like what do I have to lose if I make bad music I think you, you gain because you're you're just learning you're you're doing the process so then the next time you have something that you are more happy with you're better at doing the process Absolutely. What was it about the third time you went around with this EP that was different than the other two? As I said, I I shouldn't get bored when I listen to my stuff. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, I was just uh, not feeling it the first two times. So... Uh, was was that you, was, you think? Was that your mood at the time or was it the, something about the music? I th no, I think it was the music. Yeah. I mean, even I, I kept everything. I mean, I didn't delete anything. And even going back and listening, I'm like, uh-uh, that's mm -hmm. not, <laughs> that should never be released uh, the way it is. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, go back to that and... Uh, Resample something, or you know, and come up with something new at some point. I don't know, but mm. uh, it will definitely not get released the way it is. <laughs> yeah. And was it that process of resampling that suddenly it started to click for you? With that album, I did actually. Uh, there is one track in there that is actually. Another of the tracks uh, that is stretched and cut up and uh, 
so yeah i did use that uh that process in mm. that album and um <clears throat> usually when i when i work on more club oriented if you want uh, track um, albums or eps i try to uh have more dancey stuff and more ambient stuff so i like having a balance between the two not the whole right. thing uh just beats you know uh-huh. yeah and uh, i i usually have a, a concept behind the eps or albums there is usually a theme to the to the whole thing or or like with the collapsing structure um a theme and um, a, a music motif that will uh, uh, glue the whole thing together mm -hmm. and uh, do you set out with those themes in mind or do you sort of find them as you go uh usually my approach is um turn my computer on open ableton blank project and just start <laughs> uh -huh. okay uh, uh sometimes something will start on the phone for example not on ableton because sometimes i just get an idea i don't know when i go to bed at night you know to sleep yeah. I, I just feel like i want to do something i just turn open one of my apps because also, I also have a lot of uh, music apps on the phone so I can just uh, <coughs> record small ideas or yeah so mm. that's cool so or sometimes I just record uh, uh, yeah I just record a sound for example that turns into an album later yeah yeah, so sometimes you get the inspiration along the way, kind of like uh, yeah, yeah. You catch a wave, you kind of find it. I I noticed in one of your vid recent videos, you were using the Borderlands app, and and that is just uh, one of the coolest apps. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. For especially for like uh, ambient and textures and interesting like um, time stretch granular weird stuff. Yeah, and it's getting better because the the developer is um, releasing new has released actually a new version not long ago, mm -hmm. a few months ago, and he added um, ring modulation and uh, a few other really interesting yeah, stuff. I think you can yeah. record into it now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, I actually, I haven't uh, I haven't done that yet. Mm. I usually uh, import stuff that I have recorded somewhere else either on the phone or that i have uh, uh, i don't know made an ableton or something and uh then i ex export it and import it into uh, borderlands um nice. yeah i haven't tried that uh, the the direct recording yet mm. yeah it's just another thing i haven't tried the ring modulation <laughs> i'll have to check that out <laughs> that sounds fun but um, so uh, what are you working on next? Any plans? Anything new coming up? I'm actually working on a track for Citizen Memory uh, uh, Smithsonian project, uh, and uh, I have a few stuff going on, but I don't I don't really know where they're going. Honestly, um, mm -hmm. collabs and stuff like that, uh, especially now that we're all on lockdown and yeah. uh, no gigs and all that so uh, yeah i don't really I, I don't really have anything uh planned for release or anything right but yeah i'm i'm always working on something new yeah well that seems i mean i i, ca I cannot live without making music uh -huh. some days i just don't feel uh, fresh enough to work and and it feels wrong. <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that seems to be like um, evident in, in your output and in just 
the way you are um, kind of like always just pushing your own envelope and searching for new things and you, you don't seem to be the one to sort of settle in on something and be like, all right, this is my thing. This is what I do. You seem to be more, I want to see how far I can go and what new places I can find. Yeah, I mean, sound is literally magical and limitless. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I like to explore that. Yeah, that's cool. I, some of my favorite parts about music and making music is that exploration. I think that's a big reason why I like to make so many instruments inside of live and put samples in the sampler and time stretch things in ways they were never meant to be stretched and <laughs> just to like find out what will happen if I do this. And I think for me too, um, my best stuff happens when I have like a question or like a, a let's see what happens if I do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, where do you like to send people to check out your work? Um, is there like kind of like a home base you like to tell people to go to? Oh yeah, I have uh, most my most of my uh, releases are on Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. So uh, if they search my name, they will find uh, yeah, yeah. my page. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, uh, I have uh, Mixcloud too, where I usually uh, upload my live performances. Or my very long uh, uh, improvisations. Hmm. Okay. And uh, yeah, I also have uh, stuff on SoundCloud. Nice. Well, I'll have all that in the show notes by the time people are listening so they can go check all that out. And uh, some you. of the other things too, like the Music Weekly Challenges and the Cities and Memories um, will also be in there too. Um, I oh, want thank you. Yeah, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk and share some of your process and philosophy with us. It was a pleasure, actually. Really interesting conversation. Oh, good. I'm glad. Yeah, I, you know, uh, when I get off this call and after I let my dogs out, you, I, I want to go make some music now. <laughs> Just cool. Talking to you. Cool. So I appreciate that for me for the inspiration. So thanks. That's cool. And I'll say thank you to everyone for listening. You can check out Stephanie's work. I'm going to spell it out in case you don't feel like going to the show notes. It's S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-M-E-R-C-H-A-K. And then you can do .bandcamp.com. And there's there's a lot to go through. There's a lot of releases. And it's it's a lot of variety too, which I think is really cool. And is kind of showcases the fact that you like to experiment so much. So um, yeah, check that out, everybody. And thank you for listening.